What on earth is Kamala Harris doing? Vice President was put in charge of the border crisis months ago. Great fanfare by Joe Biden before his only big press conference. He said she was going to tackle these big problems. And here we are months into the process. She has not yet even gone down to the border. Laughs in the face of reporters who suggest that she should be going down to the border. Let's take a look at Kamala Harris and what she's saying about the immigration situation. Now, remember, I'm Dan Stein, President of FAIR, and you want to subscribe. Of course, I know you know the drill, but you want to get all of our content, including this important React video, because, you know, we don't have a lot of insight into where she's coming from on this. So I'm here to tell you, I'm going to give you the straight scoop on what she's doing. Now, first thing I want to do, we're going to be reviewing a speech that she gave just a little while ago before a conference called Coast. It's a conference on the Americas. And I want you to take a few minutes to look at this original opening picture of this video we're going to be looking at, okay? Take a look at her face. This is a still shot that opens the video we're going to be talking about. Does this look like a person who's projecting confidence? Does this look like a person who actually looks like they're self-possessed and know where they're going? Candidly, if you want to know my opinion, and it's just my opinion, she looks scared to death. Uncomfortable. Kamala Harris, one of the problems she has is she does not connect with people. Why is that? Well, because she's apparently not sincere. And when she does try to sound sincere, she comes across like she's lecturing and talking down to you. But let's take a look at the actual video and take a look at what her comments are, because I want to sit there and tell you what, in fact, I think she's actually telling us. OK, so let's get started. Eight years ago, President Joe Biden addressed this conference then Vice President, he led our nation's diplomatic efforts within the Northern Triangle and with Mexico. Recently, he asked me to take the lead. This is a priority for our nation. Okay. Now, does that sound like somebody whose job is to monitor a border crisis? She, of course, hasn't gone down to the border. She hasn't looked at the border. She hasn't even inspected the situation down there. Hasn't analyzed why people might be coming across that border why the policies of the administration might be attracting people to come across the border. But instead, apparently her mission now is to helm the diplomatic relations with Mexico and the Northern Triangle, the general diplomatic relations. Now, that was not what Joe Biden said her job was. Her job was to root out the reasons why people were coming and to try to figure out how to turn that around. But she isn't doing that. She's saying she's doing something else. So let's hear more about what she's doing and a role that I take very seriously. We are all well aware of the immediate situation. How can she be well aware of a situation when she hasn't been down to the border to look at it? When she's in fact made a point of not looking at it? How can you actually address a crisis if you refuse to do on-site inspections and actually see what's going on for yourself? Maybe you're in denial about why it's happening. The citizens of El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, are leaving their homes at alarming rates. But there's a fundamental truth behind that headline. People in the region do not want to leave their homes. OK, they're leaving their homes at alarming rates, but they don't want to leave their homes. Well, if they don't want to leave their homes, why are they leaving their homes? They're doing it of their own volition. Nobody's making them leave their homes. No, they're leaving their homes because they want to go to the United States. But what does this point mean? Nothing, of course. They do not want to leave the communities they have known their entire lives. The church they go to every Sunday, the park they take their children to, their friends, their family, their community. I do believe they leave only when they feel they must. And I'm thinking about people whose homes have been washed away by hurricanes, people who are parents who have sons who have been threatened by drug cartels, people who have daughters who have been targeted by human traffickers, people who do not have enough to eat. Now, if people hear that their relatives are up here working, their parents are up here working, their friends are up here working, they're making money, making more money. They're sending money back home. And your relatives aren't, aren't uh, staying back there, but everybody's going up there. And you think you have an opportunity to come to the United States where your average annual income is going to blow away the average annual income in most of these countries. 
where you think you might have a shot at the American dream, what are you going to do? Of course, people make the decision to move based on a rational assessment of what's in their interest. They make the decision to move because they've been able to collect enough money from relatives who are sending it back, called remittances, in order to pay the smugglers to get them up through Mexico to the border. They're also coming because they hear the United States is no longer enforcing departure, no longer removing people, no longer actually enforcing immigration law. They've heard that the Department of Homeland Security is releasing people on their own recognizance or even flying them into the country to join their relatives. Why on earth wouldn't they come here? If they thought they could materially advance their situation, this is what people do. Why does the United States have a border? Because we're a wealthy country and we're trying to keep ourselves wealthy enough to be able to deliver the American dream to the American people. Sovereignty entails responsibility. These countries have responsibility for their own affairs. They're not being driven out at the point of a gun. Yes, there's gang violence. Yes, there's high level of civil violence. Yes, there's political corruption. But that isn't the explanation for why they're all coming now. They're all coming now because the Biden administration told them to come. Now, if you're going to be in that level of denial, you can't fix the problem. All right, let's listen to more of what she has to say. People who are out of work. People who have lost hope. Many Americans are out of work. Many Americans don't want to go back to work, apparently, but that doesn't mean they're leaving the country, does it? And that's why they leave home and come to the United States. They are suffering, they are in pain. Many are experiencing unimaginable anguish. So we want to help. Our administration wants to help. We want to pick back up the kind of work President Joe Biden started when he was vice president. We want to help people find hope at home. And so we are focused on addressing both the acute factors and the root causes of migration. And I believe this is an important distinction. We must focus on both. First, the acute factors, the catastrophes that are causing people to leave right now, the hurricanes, the pandemic, the drought, and extreme food insecurity. And then there are the long-standing issues, the root causes. And I'm thinking of corruption, violence, and poverty, the lack of economic opportunity, the lack of climate adaptation, and climate resilience. Nothing that she has mentioned is capable of being changed in the near term by this administration. The hurricanes were come quite some time ago. The generalized level of poverty has been there for a long time. Civil violence, gang violence, it's all there. It was there during the Obama administration. The only thing the Biden, the Obama administration did was fly people into the country, allow them to apply for humanitarian parole from inside the country, and then violating the law, flew them into the country. And that's apparently what she intends to do now. So the Biden administration, the Obama administration rather, did not fix these problems any more than this administration has the ability to fix these problems. So. What are the chances in the four years of this administration they could possibly make a meaningful impact? Most of the money they would provide would be taken by corrupt officials or it would be used by people who want to make the trek to the U.S. As long as you keep the borders open, as long as you are hospitable to massive illegal entry, as long as you convey that once you get in, you're never going to have to go home, they're going to keep coming and they will keep coming. So this person is basically lying to us in a total state of denial about the reality. And then when she starts talking about climate change, this is a total excuse for inaction to protect the American people. It should be seen for what it is. The lack of good governance. All right, we're supposed to fix all the governments. First of all, there are people coming from other countries besides the Northern Triangle and Mexico. They're coming from Venezuela. They're coming from, will be coming from Chile, apparently. Brazil, they're coming from from Middle Eastern countries, they're coming from China, they're coming from all over the world. And those numbers are increasing. They call them other than Mexicans. They're not just coming from the Northern Triangle. This administration is creating a migration crisis from all over the world because of the policies they have adopted, they have adopted in the last several months. Just this weekend, we learned that the Salvadoran parliament moved to undermine its nation's highest court. 
An independent judiciary is critical to a healthy democracy and a strong economy. So now, in order to get control of our borders, we have to rebuild the entire judicial system of El Salvador. We have to get into the process of nation building, apparently, recreating or reconstructing these nations. I mean, wouldn't it be easier just to make them a state of the United States at this point? Are we just going to run, micromanage these countries? And then I'm assuming somewhere along the way, she's going to be offering concessions and how many people we take in exchange for their cooperation because there's no, there's no free lunch, right? We know that. On this front, on every front, we must respond. So there is much work that needs to be done to combat violence in the Northern Triangle, violence against Afro-descendants, Violence, generalized violence, does not make everybody a refugee. We have a refugee process for screening people through international agencies, Department of State, people all over the world who are bona fide political refugees. People fleeing generalized poverty, generalized violence, generalized corruption are not refugees. Our asylum system should not be a preferred way of getting into the country as opposed to refugee system. Asylum should be for people who are here legally and as a, as a result of changed circumstances cannot go back home, who need temporary protection to work for positive political change at home. It should not be a system whereby people can show up at the border, make an asylum claim, come into the country, and then disappear. Obviously, this is a flawed concept. Anybody with the brains of a chicken can figure this thing out. Violence against indigenous people. Violence against LGBTQ people, violence against young people, violence against women. What is this lapidary repetition about violence proving? There's violence in these countries. There's violence in Chicago. There's violence in American cities all over the place. <clears throat> There's violence in the United States. There's violence in all countries at some level. Does that mean everybody's a refugee from these countries? No. What is she saying? What is the point of this? And she's going to solve all these problems? And I've spent much of my career defending survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. I have fought for the equality and the safety of every group I just named. And I believe, as I know all of you do, that we must stand up for the basic human rights of all people. Sure, nobody would disagree with that, but what's this got to do with managing a border crisis? What does this have to do with getting people to comply with our immigration laws? We're enforcing them the way they're written by Congress. We're carrying out the interests of what the American people want to see on their own borders. And when those rights are violated, I will say it again, we must respond. In El Salvador, in the face of violence, we must focus on high crime areas and give young people alternatives to gang recruitment. In Honduras, in the wake of hurricanes, we must deliver food, shelter, water, and sanitation to the people. This is somebody who has never had executive authority at any level in her career. She came out of California and through various techniques rose to the top of the political food chain, then came into the Senate, where she didn't serve an entire term now, she's vice president. Zero executive authority of any kind. Obviously, she's never run a private business. Now she's going to be running, running El Salvador, running Guatemala, like she's the mayor of these, of these cities, giving a state of, the, state of the city address. This is, cannot possibly be what Joe Biden talked about when he talked about tackling a border crisis. The border crisis happened after Biden took office because he changed all the policies the Trump administration had in place to detach yourself from the reality of what you did. Talking about trying to clean up generalized violence in a city you know, thousands of miles away. This is quackery. This is political gibberish. Nonsense. It's all high-minded sounding rhetoric. You can all agree with the general spirit of the tenor of the remarks, assuming it's our business. But this isn't related to the problem, not in any direct way, not in any meaningful or programmatic way. And in Guatemala, as farmers endure continuous droughts, we must work with them 
to plant drought-resistant crops. We must also help them and help women farmers increase their harvests. This work makes a difference. This sounds like noblesse oblige. This sounds like the Peace Corps in 1955. It's saying that there's no modern understanding of agriculture in these countries. That they don't understand the idea of drought-resistant crops. This is so condescending. This is so arrogant. And it's, it's complete and total detachment from reality. And the long-term process, by the time she ever begins to tackle these things, there these entire countries will have already moved to the United States. There won't be anybody there but a few gang members and people cultivating drugs. I mean, this is absurd. However, no matter how much effort we put in on curbing violence, on providing disaster relief, on tackling food insecurity, on any of it, we will not make significant progress if corruption in the region persists. Okay, now we're gonna fix all the corruption in these governments, corruption we've been watching and dealing with for decades, centuries even. And she's gonna fix the corruption problem by herself in this administration, because otherwise we can't control our borders. Otherwise, everybody who comes in who wants to make an asylum claim has to be released, given work documents, and let them into the country. Access to public benefits, health care, you name it. Stimulus checks. I mean, you have to be kidding me. Obviously, we want to get rid of corruption anywhere, including in our own government, in our own country. But this can't possibly be a politically realistic approach. Is this really... Who's running this country? <laughs> if corruption persists, history has told us it will be one step forward and two steps back. And we know corruption causes government institutions to collapse from within. She's going to start, and already has started, accusing various people of being corrupt. They started their lists, and they're going to start pulling out pillars of stability in these governments. She says they're going to collapse because of corruption. Maybe, sometimes corruption actually helps them to be sustained. It depends on what they are. But this is typical. They're going to start going after and attacking officials, leading potentially to a breakdown in the government's stability, potentially starting an alternative political movement of some kind that she can't control or we can't control. And this is what happens when you get into pernicious nation building. Preventing people from getting their children educated, from getting a business started, from getting a fair trial. In the Northern Triangle, we also know that corruption prevents us from creating the conditions on the ground to best attract investment. I think the basic premise here is that she has a complete lack of respect for these countries and the people in them. She's talking down, she's talking lecturing, she's telling them what they can and can't do and who they should and shouldn't employ. Obviously, everybody agrees that corruption is bad, but these, this has been an endemic part of these societies going on forever. So it's interesting and it's a nice idea, but it has no practical impact in the meaningful near term in this administration on our border crisis. I mean, this just cannot be that the, this is the person the president put in charge of handling the border crisis. And around the world, we know that corruption inhibits shared prosperity. In fact, the global cost of corruption is as much as 5% of the world's GDP. 5%. The work from combating corruption to combating climate change will not be easy. This really sounds like a high school public policy presentation, to be honest with you. They're going to solve climate change and endemic corruption in these societies in order to figure out somehow maybe someday to stop this flooding of our borders by caravans and orchestrated smuggling operations. There's a huge amount of money involved in this, far more than we're going to be providing in the way of, of, of foreign aid capital. So, so what exactly is the operational significance of any of this? And it is not new. Apparently, Kamala, Kamala Harris's approach is to keep hands off the nitty gritty of actually addressing real policy, specific policy, meaningful policy. 
To protect her aspirations, apparently, to being a president in the future, she believes she can't really roll up her sleeves and get involved in the nitty gritty of immigration policy. But in fact, that's the source of the problem. That's the whole problem. These other things she's talking about are so abstract, so huge, so beyond the capability of this administration to tackle in any short-term way, and frankly, in any way, not with a country with almost $30 trillion of national debt, that it's a joke, okay? But the worst part is she's lecturing and talking down to us and to these countries. And she really seems to believe we're stupid. Does she really believe that our kids should have their education jeopardized because these countries can't get their act together? Or there's corruption? These countries have been independent sovereign states for a very long time. They have the responsibility of fixing their own political system not sending everybody up here. It's a flawed analysis. It doesn't get her where she wants to go. She has no idea where she wants to go. As a result, she's not going to change anything, not in any practical sense. And it could not be more important. And it will take all of us, all of us. The United States cannot do it alone. With all of us gathered here today, I'm very hopeful about what we can accomplish together. Our administration is implementing a comprehensive strategy with governments and international institutions, the private sector, foundations, and community organizations. The idea here is that our work will be coordinated and that every sector will have a role to play. So far, the only coordination that we see involving nonprofit organizations, the Department of Homeland Security and Office of Refugee Resettlement is helping smugglers bring minor children, juveniles into the country, flying them in at taxpayer expense all over the country. So they seem to be doing a very good job assisting as co-conspirators in criminal alien smuggling. And that's it so far. So wouldn't you think the approach would be to fix that problem first? First, regional governments. Governments in the region can take on corruption, lift up their communities, and provide safety and security for their citizens. If the governments are corrupt, they're not going to root out corruption. Isn't that kind of obvious? For instance, last week I had a bilateral meeting with the Guatemalan president and we agreed to strengthen cooperation to shut down human traffickers and smugglers. In just a few days, I will meet virtually with the president of Mexico. And in a month from now, I will visit both countries. In every situation, what she is going to be doing is making concessions to ease and facilitate the movement of people from these countries into the United States. That is what she's going to be offering in exchange for some nominal, phony cooperation. Trust me on this. This is what she's going to be doing. They're going to be facilitating routes for people to apply for benefits without having to come through Mexico and show up at the border. They're going to be flown in directly. That will be the net effect of her, quote, negotiating. Second, there is a role for governments outside of the region and international institutions. The United States Ambassador to the United Nations is working within the UN to support their humanitarian response plan. I've also spoken with world leaders from Canada, Finland, Ireland, Japan, about partnering with us to help the Northern Triangle. And for our part, the United States has announced that we will send an additional $310 million to the region. Departments and agencies across our federal government are joining in this effort. You'll notice, as this whole administration does, when they're coming up with these initiatives, they're, they're always process. We will coordinate with our allies, come up with a strategy to do an analysis, to produce a report, to come up with an assessment, to then develop a plan. If you've ever been to your local public school meetings, you know they do the same thing. This is sort of government ease for going through the motions and endlessly thinking about and studying ideas. Theoretically, I suppose there's a role for this to be played, but there's nothing to do with a border crisis or any practical near-term impact. 
the United States Department of Commerce is planning a virtual trade mission. Our agricultural department is increasing food assistance. And of course, none of this was going on during the Trump administration. We weren't promoting trade with Central America, with Mexico. Yeah, the Trump administration was using trade as leverage to get their cooperation. What is her leverage? Her leverage seems to be that she's willing to facilitate the entry of their nationals, not get their cooperation to deter it. USAID has deployed a disaster assistance response team. And as I had told our cabinet secretaries, we must be ambitious and deliberate. Again, more meaningless rhetoric. Mindless, empty, delivered in the most condescending fashion imaginable with this little smile, like, you know, I know what I'm doing. She doesn't know what she's doing, obviously. We must also be proactive not just in the Northern Triangle, but across Latin America. Third, we must think beyond government. I've spoken with foundation leaders who have been sending support to the region for a long time and are now prepared to do more. I've also been engaging with a number of businesses in the United States and business leaders in the United States about their interest in investing in the region and the barriers that may stand in their way. Private sector investments can create jobs and speed up progress. Wouldn't it be nice to have a president and a vice president who are interested in attracting investment into the United States, attracting and bringing business back to the United States, helping bring manufacturing back to the United States? They're taking U.S. companies and telling them that they should be investing overseas. Theoretically, not a problem. But right now, the United States has its own economic problems and challenges, and wouldn't it be great if that were the priority? Just saying. Meanwhile, community organizations can help us implement a place-based approach, targeting those communities that have been hardest hit. Community organizations will also help us to restore hope. Last Tuesday, I had a virtual meeting with a group of long-standing community leaders in Guatemala. They talked about the work they have been doing to feed people, to house people, to find people jobs, all while taking on relentless corruption. It is hard and difficult work that they do, and they are 100% committed to it, and they've committed their lives to it. They are committed to building a better life for all of those people they serve. And when I met with those leaders, I was reminded not only of the region's problems, but also of its potential. Its potential to recover. Its potential to rebuild. Its potential to write its next chapter. It is in that spirit that the United States will continue this work, knowing that we are neighbors, knowing that our strength depends on one another, and that our hope grows together. Thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you. So this represents the most important statement the administration Vice President, the President of the United States, has made about the border crisis since she was appointed in March by the President to tackle the situation. To put it mildly, this is discouraging. This is depressing. It sounds more like something the Secretary of State might make to a conference about regional cooperation, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that if you study the history of, of countries that systematically discourage their own populations from staying, that encourage their people to leave, what do you find? You find that there's an overarching pessimism. You find that there's political stagnation, that there's fatalism that takes hold. As many of the most ambitious and capable people leave the country, sending money back home, it's the dependent who remain behind. Those are the people now the administration is bringing into the country, illegally, by the way, and working with smugglers. 
This organization is, this, this administration is an witting and intentional co-conspirator with the process of alien smuggling, bringing in alien miners to join people here illegally, already here with the promise that there will be no enforcement, no removals at any point in the future while they simultaneously push Congress for mass amnesty. How will these countries ever recover? How will they ever rebuild? How will they ever attract capital? If the people who've been working here illegally or under TPS, temporary protected status, for a number of years are never at any point encouraged to go back home and apply those skills and talents in their home countries. FAIR is not intentionally trying to be mean and nasty in these cases, obviously. Bold leadership, though, requires grown-up decision-making and intelligent operations. It is not in our country's interest, nor is it in the interest of these sentient countries, to perpetuate a process of draining off their populations, the people who are more ambitious and want to work. Much as American elites may like the idea of getting low-cost, hard-working labor, it hurts these countries far more than it helps the United States. It hurts the United States in many ways, particularly when they bring up dependent relatives, which they are now. Kamala Harris does not seem to have any practical approaches to deterring illegal immigration, no near-term prospects of solving the problem. Meantime, the administration's immigration policies are being transmitted not just through Northern Triangle, not just through Mexico, not even through just South America, but all over the world that suggests that this country is no longer at all serious or at all committed to enforcing its immigration laws. As a result, people all over the world are planning to make the move, are making the move. We see them coming now from all these other countries, crossing our borders illegally. Our border patrol is overwhelmed. They're closing detention centers. They're shutting down 287G agreements. They're rolling up fines for people who don't leave when they're supposed to. They're allowing people to ignore immigration law with no sanctions or penalties. Indeed, they're making a mockery of the entire immigration control system, the entire system itself. Kamala Harris has the audacity to sit there with her smug little smile and lack of eye contact to try to tell us that she's going to lead the charge to fix these countries root and branch, brick and mortar from the bottom up, working with U.S. foundations and community organizations down in these countries. Well, why didn't they do it during the Obama administration if it was so easy to do? Clearly, they're not interested in controlling borders. She's not interested in looking at what's going on, and she's not interested in any practical analysis of how this administration's policies have led to this border crisis. As a result, we can expect nothing from the leadership of Kamala Harris in this area. Nothing but empty rhetoric, empty promises, a lot of meaningless action that represents arranging deck chairs or running around in circles, a lot of consultation, a lot of conferences, but no real progress. Who's going to fix the border crisis? Apparently it's going to be up to the American people and the American electorate. I'm Dan Stein. Thanks for listening.